Hello, welcome to my review of uh, Lord of the Rings, Rings of Power, episode six, with a little bit of commentary on episode five, as I can recall it. Um, my name is Aaron. I am a composer. Um, I write music based on Tolkien's world and as well as taking uh, film and game and TV commissions as well. Um, if you want to check out some of the work I've done previously, um, check the links down below in the description section. Um, the main one I would go to would be silmarillionsymphony.bandcamp.com. Um, so for all you Tolkien folks out there, um, yes, it is a symphony based on Tolkien's Silmarillion. I have not gotten through that very dense and very wonderful, um, novel in its entirety as of yet. Um, it's sort of a lifetime project for me. Um, but that being as it may, this is, uh, obviously Tolkien is something I care deeply about. So uh, as you've seen in some of the other videos, I've had uh, some nice things to say about the new series and some that you might consider a criticism or whatever, what have you. Um, anyway, let's get into episode six. Um, we start out and Adar is uh, dropping these seeds in the ground. Um, I guess this is an elven tradition. Um, I haven't seen anything like this in any of the literature and uh, quite frankly, I don't really mind it. Um, I found to this point, um, having paid attention to all the characters and especially the ones that Amazon has, uh, made up kind of out of whole cloth. Um, the one I like probably the best is Adar out of the bunch. Um, um, because I think he, they've been able to explain more about why he's doing what he's doing to this point than, uh, than really everybody else, including the established characters, which kind of throws me, to be honest. Um, and we'll get to more Galadriel and uh, the way the female characters are being written in the in the show um, a little later. And that probably will turn into its own video, to be quite honest. Um, so we get into it. They're planting these seeds. Adar's doing this, and then he's telling the orcs they're brothers and sisters. Again, I this depiction of orcs is not a passing muster for me, um, that, oh, they just want to have a home. Well, that's nice. And, and I understand Tolkien wasn't necessarily completely resolved on that. The orcs were irredeemable or that they wouldn't, you know, again, this is very, very apocryphal, but after the, the last battle, um, and Morgoth is defeated and Fionor is able to reforge, um, or at least get, the, get the, uh, all the light of the trees out of the Silmarils and they can make the world anew. Um, maybe there's a little bit of hope for the, the orcs there. And, you know, you can find some of that because in Tolkien, a little bit of hope for some sort of healing for the orcs, let's say, um, in, uh, it, based on Tolkien's Christianity as well. Um, so I don't have a problem with that so far as it goes. However, um, I do like that Adar's given them all names, even though that's, uh, you know, they each have a name, they each have a heart. That, like, that's cool. Um, but one of the main f bits from Tolkien that, that it, I would say is established and, and that uh, they've take, the show's taken a different direction than the lore um, would be just the fact that the orcs actually, they have a massive amount of hatred for themselves and resentment towards anybody that's lording over them. Now, Adar later says, it's like, they they have no master, I'm not their master. It's like, Okay, but you command them. So, okay, so that doesn't necessarily make sense. But anyway, um, so then we, we move along um, from that bit into uh, the bit with Adar, or not Adar, Arondir, um, and Bronwyn, and they're trying to figure out what's going to happen before this battle and all this stuff, and off the orcs go to the, the castle and whatnot, and they've got their plan. Um <laughs> Um, I think the tactical stuff from uh, Rondir is pretty impressive. Um, and uh, I would say the athleticism there, if uh, if the actor, and I'm not going to butcher his name, um, but if he's doing half of that stuff, that's pretty impressive athleticism. So props to him for that, especially some of the, uh, the spin kicks, even though they're a little, you know, it's a little bit kung fu for Middle Earth, but hey, you, elves are elves. Um, not a big stumbling block for me, um, but they get that first bit where they take down the where where he takes down the tower. Um, 
I find it very difficult to believe that that tower is held up and just that one rope is the thing that's keeping it all together. But hey, it's a fantasy thing. So, you know, maybe rules don't necessarily apply the same way. That That's a little bit too much suspension of disbelief for me. Um, but uh, so they have that and then they have where things really go to battle. Um, where the citizens of Tirharad are inexplicably hanging around watching this thing. And that bit I don't resonate with at all. Um, <laughs> cause I'm thinking this guy just bought you probably a couple of hours to get the hell out of there, <laughs> um, to get out of the war zone, to get away from all this stuff. I know you want to defend their homes. Maybe there was a decision. Again, they didn't talk about. I don't think they really talked about this. Um, you figure you would defend the tower that you have rather than defending from a little village. But that's, you know, this is this is the direction we've taken. Um, so we go through all of that. Um, Bronwyn can't light a fire. Um, and that's unfortunate because her friend ends up dying. Um, but they eventually light the fire and blow some things up. So that's... That's kind of cool. The pyrotechnics in this were pretty cool, I thought. Um, I'm not a huge... I don't need pyrotechnics in everything, but I thought this was cool. Um, and there's more in the towards the end, of course, um, if you watch the episode. And if you haven't watched the episode yet and you're watching this review prior to watching it, go watch the episode first. This is going to be full of spoilers. Although I'll try and talk around some of it um, as best I can. <coughs> Excuse me. Um... So they go through the first bit, um, and the orcs go through the, uh, the orcs go through the front, the front gate or the, the main bridge into the little town there. Um, and the townspeople are largely victorious, um, and, uh, and the worst bit, and, and it's, it's really kind of sad. I think if it was set up a little bit better, um, the emotional impact would have been greater. Um, although it was a, it was a decent surprise when you find out that, uh, that first, that you didn't know it was the first wave of attack, but it was a first, the, the first attack from the orcs, um, has a bunch of their former neighbors that, so there's a lot of men that died, um, that were dressed up like orcs. Um, and so you see this sort of, uh, it's, it's dark genius, I would say, and, uh, and a measure of intelligence in a villain that, uh, you know, that for what, it, for what it's worth, it's something, it's very shrewd, very cunning. And, uh, it, it's, you know, it's a cruel way to, to do battle, but, uh, it's what, you know, one of the original orcs, let's say, um, which is what Adar turns out to be a little later. Um, you know, that sounds about the right amount of cunning. No wonder the elves hate these guys. Um, so they go through that as they're trying to clean up the mess and some arrows start flying as they start realizing they didn't just kill orcs, they killed they killed their own. Um, even though their own had turned on them, <laughs> just throwing it out there. Um, but ne nevertheless, it's still, it's still sad. Again, if it was set up a little bit better, it would have been far more emotional. Um, but uh, then the arrows start flying and people start people start dying and you start seeing the orcs coming in. And then the actual attack starts, and there's a, it's really a no-hoper for the townspeople. They just have to hide in the tavern. Bronwyn gets an arrow through the shoulder. It looked like she got hit by two. I, I'm going to... Uh, other people have pointed this out. It looks like she got hit twice. Um, and so when I saw them only pulling one arrow out of her, I was a little taken aback. So that's something, you know, if they had actual live projectiles kicking around, or maybe the... You know, I, I've not been on a film set in a very long time, but <clears throat> with all the VR stuff that we're able to do now, just the stuff that's consumer, um, I wonder if there's a way that, that they're able to sort of show the actors and actresses how stuff is flying around in the in their sort of vicinity. But uh, that, was, that was a little weird to see her get... It, it looked like she got hit twice, but she didn't get hit twice. She only got the one nasty one through the shoulder, which was, you know, we'll get to that. Um, 
And of course, Theo's in there. He he looked like he got hit by something too. It looked like he reacted to something, but uh, um, they get in the tavern and then Adar and then break in because there's really not much resistance in a tavern. It's not much of a keep. Um, but anyway, um, so of course Adar wants the sword. Um, and we're st- we figure out right by the end of this it, that exactly what this the sword that Theo was carrying around what it actually is. Um, I guess we figured that out in five actually, but uh, we didn't know what it would do. Um, all we have for from Arondir later in the episode is telling Galadriel because they meet in a few minutes. Um, is that there's no he cannot get away with this thing. Um, so we figure that out eventually, but. Um, of course, Adar is now interrogating Rondir again with uh, with Theo and Bronwyn, and he, he's killing people in the tavern. And um, and cruelly, the reactions of these people looks very strange because um, they're all like standing still. They don't really react all that much as they're run through, which is, which kind of took me aback too. But so that was a little rough. Um, and of course, Theo eventually gives it up. And then as they're, I'm, sh- I'm sure Adar and them were going to murder everybody in the tavern and you start hearing the hoofs going. And of course you see th- this entire time you'd seen that, uh, the Numenorians with Galadriel were all on the ship and they're all, they're coming to middle earth. They're almost there. And then you can see earlier prior to this, that the Numenorians, uh, you got this big horse charge happening and they're just full blast. They're ready to go. Don't know how they know where exactly to go other than Galadriel's map. There was Galadriel's map. Um, how they know to go to this exact village, I do not know. But there, there it is. Um, this is a little bit of a massive uh, plot hole there. But they get there, the Numenorians get there, and they start running everybody over, which is... Which is cool. Like it, it was it, it's somewhat exciting, and you know the believability is is what it is at this point. Um, what we what we didn't see a lot of in that um, that whole sequence, which was pretty long, um, it was almost twenty minutes of action sequence. Um, and that's uh, if you if you follow Bear McCreary on on Instagram or Twitter or anything. Um, wherever he is, I think I have him on tw- uh, Instagram. Um, it, he wrote a 20 minute cue for that, which I have to say the amount of energy taken to write a 20 minute cue is pretty exhausting. Um, so, uh, kudos to him on that. Um, you didn't hear a ton of dialogue at that point, which, um, I have to say for the, the way things have been written so far, I wasn't upset by that. Um, so that was that was good, and then you have this really strange, and there's a lot of strange little strategic things there um, that feel like they need to be explained a little bit better. Which is uh, a sealed door is held back um, with the queen and the rest of the horsemen that didn't go in the in the first charge, and then he sort of paces for it on his horse and then the queen tells him go. And I'm like, and nobody else goes with him. I do not understand that. Is he just wanting to help his dad and she's cool with it? I, like, I don't know. Um, and how does she know him? Um, but anyway, um, so you have some moments in there where you see the Numenorians fighting and some better than others. Um, poor Antimo, not made for this. Um, uh, yeah. Um, you see a sealed horse horse get cut a little bit and I'm, uh, I was surprised at how that actually looked sort of like believable, honestly, it was, that was kind of cool. Um, and so they win the battle and then you see a Rondir and Galadriel, they, they link up and Halbrand saves a Lendil with the spear and so forth. And then they chase after Adar essentially. Um, and the horse chase was one of the cooler bits of the thing for me. Um, I am intrigued at how they managed not to injure any horses with Halbrand's little trip move there. In hockey, they call it a can opener. Um, <laughs> um, it's when you stick a stick in between 
your opponent's legs and you twist <laughs> and he goes down in a heap. Um, used to be legal, isn't legal anymore. Um, but uh, I wonder how, how they did that with the horse. The horse in the, in the, you know, on screen, it got up fine, but of course um, they wouldn't have done it that way um, without being able to do it safely for the animal, I'm sure. Um, and so they catch Adar and then Halbrand's ready to run him through. Um, this would have been a really good time to do a little, I, I think a little bit more exposition on Halbrand, unless they must be holding him back for something, for some reason. Um, and I don't, yeah, this is where your whole, is he Sauron? Is he the witch king in training? Is he, um, the coolest one I saw today was maybe he's the king of the dead. Maybe. Um, we don't know. Um, I did not, um, I have to say, I did not like how they Aragornized him in the last one, in uh, episode five, where he shows up in this armor. And honestly, like, it looks great, but I'm like, come on, like, that is so obvious. Um, so maybe not. I would I would say don't I wouldn't do that I wouldn't lean into that too much the whole reluctant hero thing that they uh, spawned in the Jackson films and once again I have to praise the Jackson films a little bit for how they got the feel of it right because the show I think they're working their way towards it I think eventually it will somewhat make sense I'm hoping by the last episode some things will congeal um, into a cohesive narrative um and a story that really works um and has some forward motion um we don't have any harfoots in this episode if you haven't figured that out by now if you watch the episode you already know that um and i'll put it honestly whenever i haven't had to see the harfoots the show feels better for me um i don't i don't enjoy them very much and there is something to be said for the fact that somehow Adar and his orcs have more camaraderie than the Harfoots do um <laughs> they're injured screw them <laughs> they're, they're, they stay behind they'll get eaten by a wolf whatever that's the Harfoots not the orcs um and even Galadriel in the first episode there's a guy he's collapsed in the snow behind me and it's a snowstorm and we could very much die of frostbite ah leave him we keep going no, <laughs> um, it's it's weird trying to understand what what drives some of these what we know are supposed to be good characters. Like in in the Lord of the Rings, in the trilogy, you have a very clear thing that the hobbits are just they're just good people, man. <laughs> like they just want to get on with their life, um, peace and quiet, have some good food decent roof over your head that's just what their jam is and the harfoots are quite a bit more less the finished product let's say um and they i guess they understand a little bit more about the wide the wide world um and what's outside of what in the third age becomes hobbiton right so no harfoots in this episode which i think is is good i i i find them tiresome um but uh, so they're dealing with Adar. They're trying to get information out and they're trying to figure out. Gladriel wants to know where Sauron is. And then we find out that Adar is one of those original orcs captured by Morgoth when, like, right when the elves were born, essentially, or maybe from the first age, um, those that were captured and, and turned into his slaves. Um, so we get a little backstory there and, and why Adar is. I guess, fond of the orcs, I guess, or is, it seems like he just want, like he's, he says, it's like basically they, we, we want them to have a homeland. Uh, we want a homeland too for ourselves. Um, and what's wrong with that? Um, I think this gets it wrong based on the fact that the orcs are just a hateful species, um, on the whole, um, I don't have a problem with somebody wanting a homeland. <laughs> but if they're going to kill everybody that currently lives there to get it, I have an issue with that. Um, which would seem to be what they're willing to do. Um, and of course, um, Adar had the, the sword piece or the sword key, or so we think. 
um, there, and Galadriel um, interrogates him. Halbrand comes in to say, hey, the queen wants to see us, blah, blah, blah. Or I Actually, I'm not telling that correctly. Um, somebody comes to tell Halbrand. It's like, hey, you're wanted here. Um, and then uh, Muriel gives Bronwyn a lot of credit for um, saving her people, which... Uh, is true in a fashion and very untrue in another way because a Rondier kicked a lot of butt there and did all of the tactical stuff, so it would seem. Um, but uh, there you go. Um, well, credit where it's due. At least she got the people to the thing. and the, the, uh, She saved half the people by telling them to stay at Osterith, so there you go. Um, that was in the, the previous episode. Um, so give her credit where it's due there. Um, so they go through it, and then we introduce uh, Lord Halbrand, King of the Southlands. All hail the King of the Southlands. Um, he doesn't seem overly comfortable with this still. Um, and you get a bit of an overhang from the prior two episodes where Galadriel's really just been twisting his arm to go back and be like, hey, you got to fight with me. Hey, you got to fight with me. You're the rightful king of this place or whatever. Um, of course, there's the moment with Galadriel and Halbrand as well. Um which really uh, made my stomach curdle a little bit. Um, they're obviously having a little bit of a romantic moment. Um, it is what it is. Um, I, <laughs> it's, it's setting off all kinds of other wild theories in my head as to... I, I actually wonder if Galadriel's Galadriel at this point. Um which which is a little bit mind boggling, but I wonder <laughs> I wonder what the deal is there. Anyway, um, so what else is there in this? So we've got the King of the Southlands, and then um, you see that are still chained up so far so far as we know. And just prior to this, you see uh, old Waldreg. Old creepy dude that was talking to Theo a couple epi episodes ago. Kid, have you heard of Sauron? Um, and he's got the mark on his arm. Theo's got the mark on his arm, too. And uh, it wouldn't surprise me if they're setting both Theo and Waldrag up to becoming some kind of Nazgul, Mouth of Sauron, whatever. Um, um, either one. Um or Kings of the Black Numenorians or something like that. Um, any of those things, any of the baddies for the next, you know, little while of the series, let's say. Um, you have to think that Theo will come of age in a couple of years. And the way they foreshadow his character a little bit, it's like, I really liked the power that I felt when I had that thing in my hand. Um, that's cool, kid. Um, yikes. Um, and then Arondir just hands the thing back to him, and then we figure out, oh no, <laughs> this is just an axe that Adar had been carrying. So Adar, earlier in the episode, had told Waldrag, hey, I need you to do something for me. So he sent him away somewhere. We don't know where he went until the end, where he goes out back to Osterith, or what I presume is Osterith, or a dam, or something, and does the whole sword in the stone thing with the dark sword, which we had seen earlier, and this was kind of wild that Theo had a hold of it, I think, in the second episode or third episode. Um, a little bit of blood came out of it, and then the sword started expanding. And so Waldreg had this – the sword was, like, fully um, ready to go, dropped it into this little keyhole thing, twisted, and the dam goes down. Um, and water starts flowing, and it ends up going through all the tunnels and trenches that uh, – that the orcs of Adar, Adar, who said he hated Sauron and said he killed Sauron, which is a very interesting take. Definitely not true. <laughs> My goodness. Um, but, you know, you're welcome to think that, I guess. Um, that's that's cool. So they, they release all the water and it goes through all these tunnels and starts blowing stuff up and it ends up going into a Rodwin. Um, hoping I pronounce, I pronounce it close. Um, which, uh, in the third age is Mount Doom, right? And becomes Mount Doom shortly after this episode. 
in in the show's timeline definitely um <coughs> excuse me so eventually there's this cataclysmic explosion and we're towards the end of the episode at this point and things start blowing up and uh, Galadriel is standing there and actually she doesn't move for a couple of minutes and uh I have concerns about that. Um, that seems really strange um, that you, this, and this f- kind of furthers the point about how they've written Galadriel for the series, which is, in my estimation, she's Galadriel in name only. Um, this the, Otherwise, it knows, bears no relation to Galadriel in the books. Um or very, very little, like just barely, like she doesn't even have the same husband, man. Like it's rough. Um, but she just stands there instead of being this wise person that'd be like, all right, everybody, we're going to leave now. We're going to get as far away from this thing as possible. No, she stands there and watches while everybody else scrambles about. Um, and of course it's catching everybody's by surprise. Um, but you see that this this whole volcanic eruption is happening, um, and it's like you can tell the earth the earth is about to change, right? And so you've drained all the water from this this area, and so it looks like you're creating essentially Mordor. Um, and Galadriel is just standing there, not running away, not trying to get any of the Numenorians that she convinced to help her out of dodge any of the townspeople, whatever. So I'm a little, it's a little wild that she's going to stand there. We know she survives. She's in the preview for the next one. Um, I don't know how she survives, but uh, that's, that's fine. Um, I I don't understand that actually, but that's okay. They'll find a way to explain that. I hope. Um, Again, why she wouldn't help anybody is beyond me. Um, So, we just move along. That's basically the episode. Um, like for me, it's not much better than a six out of 10, to be honest, maybe five. Um, there, there are some cool things. I didn't mind some of the dialogue with a Lendil and a sealed door. Again, they, some of it felt a little bit trite and forced. Um, and I, and I want to give people a little bit of credit here. It's like, I, I, I had the chance to make some films during COVID and they had to work during COVID um, in New Zealand, which is very tight for COVID restrictions, as you know, Um, one of the tightest in the world. Um, And it it would be, I can imagine it being pretty tough to be on set and having to worry about that stuff all the time. Um, And so I'll give the actors some credit. Like some of it felt like, and if you're an actor or an actress or a producer, and you want to chime in on this, hit me in the comments. I'd love to hear, like, I'd love to hear from you anyway, but I'd love to hear from you about this. Um, if, uh, if COVID impacted your table reads and how you would do that. Cause from what I understand, people on shows, they'll sit together in a room. They will read the script out loud with one another, with the other actors in such and such a scene, and they will go through the script. Um, Saw it on The Office, saw it, uh, I think, for the original Lord of the Rings trilogy, um, saw bits and pieces of that. Um, but I I just wonder if that Im- impacted in, in such a way, because some of the dialogue feels a bit forced. And I have to say, like, I don't, I don't think I'd watched any of these actors in anything prior to this, so I don't know their body of work. But uh, you don't get hired for something like this necessarily without having a body of work. And you have, like, you have at least have a little bit. Like, you got to have something and a really great agent. Um, why not? Um, if your representation is good, hey, let's go. Um, and by that, I mean your agent. I'm not talking about representation in the other way that people have talked about. I'm not even going to touch that right now. Um, this isn't really a problem for me, though. Um, but... Uh, I wonder if table reads and stuff like that and being able to read the screen out or the script out um, impacted the way that uh, that a lot of shows during COVID would have gone down, um, especially with a crew that doesn't know one another. This is the thing. Um, 
I know that in the middle of production, if you have to start something like you would have, I think they started filming in February, 2020 or something like that, maybe in late 2019. Um, and then in March I had to just shut everything off. That is a really difficult way to work. <laughs> so I'll give them some credit on that. I think my suspicion, my suspicion is this, is that the second season, which I ideally would be filmed com almost completely outside all of the, the COVID restrictions and stuff like that. And basically like how we made films in 2018, 2019, so forth, that this should be better. It'll, it'll feel a little bit better because like some of the dialogue just feels awkward between some of the actors to me. Um, and, uh, my favorite so far, to be honest with you, would be uh, Lloyd Owen, um, uh, playing Elendil, um, I find him to be the most, I would say, relatable character of the bunch. I don't mind a Rondier either. Um, I can't shake the feeling that he's fated for not such a great end, because um, I don't think we're going to do the whole elves and men are marrying each other all over the place thing. I just don't think that's going to happen. Um, but we will find out. Um, anyway, um, I think I'm going to have to shoot out another video at some time in the next little bit talking about Tolkien writing for women. Um, there's been a lot of talk about that um, out in the wider culture, I would say. And Tolkien doesn't write women well, but I, I've, I, I'm going to push back on that a little bit. But that'll be for another time. Um, but it deserves its own video. Um, to talk about that with chapter and verse. Um, anyway, thank you very much for watching. Um, I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, uh, hit the like button. Leave me a comment down below. Um, and check out some of my links for uh, the Silmarillion Symphony or anything else that I'm doing. You can find me on Spotify, um, whatever you want to do. Um, if you want to support the work, hit up the links in the description section. Thank you very much, and uh, I'll talk to you all soon.